Hello and welcome to episode 151 of Page One, the Writers Podcast. I'm Tarek. I'm Marco and thanks for joining us on the podcast where we like to speak to writers of all kinds about their writing careers, find out how they got into the industry and try and get as many hints and tips as possible. And we do have 150 past episodes there, sitting there with some really great authors, screenwriters, uh, comic writers, video game writers, comedians, journalists. So please do have a look at the back catalogue if you haven't. There's bound to be names that you recognise and want to hear from. Uh, but last week we chatted with Ryan Cahill, who's a massively successful self-published fantasy author. And this week we're staying in the fantasy world. Yeah, this week we're chatting with Ian Green, who, uh, as Marco says, is a fantasy author whose trilogy, the Rot Storm trilogy, begins with The Gauntlet and The Fist Beneath, which came out uh 2021. Um, and his latest book, book three, comes out later on this year. And it's been a really big success, I think. It's, it's, yeah. it's a really interesting chat we have. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, it, you know, it's always interesting um, hearing about how, how fantasy writers craft these worlds that, mm -hmm. that they're writing about you know i think he really enjoys the world building side of of things and also interesting that you know he had he had had some success in terms of short stories and things like that on the more literary side of things before deciding you know what i'm going to write what i want to write which is a fantasy story and that's when yeah. he got yeah. picked up by a yeah. publisher and we also have a really uh, interesting chat with them, and similar to that way that that which we had with Ryan Cahill about the kind of current um, dichotomy in the fantasy world of traditional versus the grim dark that we yeah. see a lot of, and obviously Game of Thrones, House of Cards, House of Cards, House of Dragons is <laughs> kind of the, the the easy example everyone always thinks of, and it's the big one. But you know, you know, grim dark is a type of fantasy, and and. Lord of the Rings is, is, is another and it's, it's interesting you know I think people often just think of fantasy as Lord of yeah. the Rings type stuff but it's yeah so yeah no it, but it is and uh, you know Game of Thrones has been successful so that's probably why Grim Dark has been yeah. popular in terms of m sort of modern fantasy but you know the, the, I think there's a whole range like in any other genre there's a whole range of different stories that you can tell and different ways you can tell these types of stories yeah, and you know right. ryan cahill described i think he said one of his readers describes his writing as grim heart so it's yeah. it's got that sort of grounded gritty feel but it does have proper heroes in it whereas in game yeah. of thrones you're you're sometimes struggling to find anyone you like so yeah it is it is interesting hearing about the different approaches that different fantasy authors take to this sort of thing so we'll get straight into the episode after a quick advert for a writer's notebook and then we'll be back at the end of the podcast with a bit more chat and to let you know about next week's guest but for now on with the podcast the blank page to some it's terrifying an obstacle to overcome but we prefer to think of it as an opportunity a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head so how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying, or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realised it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made Page One. Page One is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project, divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story, so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realised you need to plan how to let people read it, so we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, a screenplay, a comic or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one.
did you always want to be a writer? Because I see you've also got a PhD in clinical epigenetics. So <laughs> it seems you had yeah. slightly diverse interests. No, but I mean, that's, that's just, that, that seems a bit easier than being a writer, you know. Um, <laughs> I, I think I, I always wanted to be a writer. I just, it just didn't seem like something that people actually did, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Like I, I grew up in a, a, just north of Aberdeen and, you know, in a little village and no novelists in that village. Um, there's no novelists in the, the nearby village. And, you know, um, there are a few in Aberdeen, I'm sure, but um, there's not a huge amount of folk where uh, writing is a viable way to, you know, um, keep a roof over your head and feed yourself yeah. as soon as mm-hmm. possible. Every, everyone, I, so, you know, I, I never did, um, I, I never actually did my uh, my hires or anything like that in English. Right. Uh, because I, I kind of, at that point, I loved it. I'd, I'd, read, I'd read the whole curriculum. You know, I'd read all the books which you would do in higher English, um, and I kind of I'd read, read them all. I read them all, and I, and I was just chatting to folk, and they were like, "Oh yeah, maybe do an English degree. You'll just end up being an English teacher." And that's yeah. I, that, that's the only potential career progression to yeah. studying English. It's and, like um, the classic high school thing of like, there's aye. like four jobs, and if you do aye. this, you have to do this, and it's so blinkered, isn't it? It's so hard yeah. to yeah, see yeah. beyond that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's so it's so inaccurate compared to you know when you actually picture yourself now as an adult and everyone you know and all the different jobs they do and all the different totally. next to the actual education so i just did biology i love biology and i and i was quite good to sit you know um, I'm, I'm not very good at uh, chemistry or physics but, but biology i can kind of um get into and so i i just ended up um so so actually the phd is, is quite stupid because i i uh i basically i wanted to move to london um because i just sat when i was about 20, 22, 20, 22, you know i'd finished my, my first degree and i was like i'm gonna move to london i'm gonna be a writer at that point, I'd really, you know, I was like, I oh, know I've got to do this, and that seemed, to, you know, to me that and at 22, I was an idiot, I'm still an idiot now, but <laughs> more so. And I was just, oh no, that's you know, I'll move to London and I'll, I'll I don't know, I'll sh- sell some short stories to Grant or whatever, and then I'll get a book deal with Penguin. And you know, by 25, I'll be, um, on a book, yeah, you know, uh, good plan, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the problem was, you know. You need a job to go and to pay rent and stuff like that, and I, I wasn't really qualified to do anything. You know, I, I used to work in a supermarket when I was at uni, um, and so my idea of like, oh, I'll come down to London and work in a bar and do that kind of stuff. I wasn't qualified to work in a bar. No bar would hire me. Um, I was qualified to do a PhD because I had a, a master's in you know in in, uh, in biology. So so, so I, I kind of and, and I enjoyed it. So it was just for me, it was kind of um, it, it, I did go into it as this idea of like always this was I, I don't know always it was it was something I really enjoyed but it was something which was a, a job so I can keep yeah. doing the writing thing in my yeah. own time yeah. um, you know, but but subsequently following that you know and getting to know the industry more and more I, I'm, I'm bloody glad I have something which I can do <laughs> um, which is not just you know relying on writing for income because it's um it's not exactly the most yeah. lucrative of business quite yeah and and so throughout that time, then even though you're doing the degree and stuff, I presume you were still writing stories, short stories, novels. Yeah, and like that. Um, yeah. So I, I think I I didn't I was mainly dicking about with it when I was at uni, um, and and then when I went and started the PhD and moved down to down south, I, I started taking it a bit more seriously and trying to you know and actually was like no, this is actually something I want to pursue. It's actually something I, you know, uh, would love to to give a good swing at. And so um, I started doing short stories then, and then just trying to find my way, you know, to what what I what I wanted to do, and, and how and how the hell do you actually do that? Because again, I didn't have any formal training. It's a very um, uh, terrifying landscape because you're surrounded by people who've got you know um, MAs in creative writing, yeah, and 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 they've got oh, I've, oh well, I did my English degree, and then I did an MA in creative writing. And you're like, well, shit, you know, I uh, read a lot of books. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, 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 yeah. Um, but no, I just, I just kind of dive, dove into the short story scene. And so I think my first, my first short story I got published was in uh, 2010 or something like that, you know, nice. which is which is a good a good while ago now. Um, <laughs> and then I just sort of, but it was all being fit in around doing a PhD, which is quite time consuming, you know, mm-hmm. just generally being in your 20s in a new city, um, so, so which is quite time consuming. Um, so, uh, you know, I was just kind of, I had a pretty good rhythm for a few years of, of you know, every I'd get a few different pieces out in short story journals and, and different um, places. But um, yeah, and then it wasn't until three or four years ago that I, and, and I was working on a novel then, which is terrible novel, but very, very luckily no one picked that up. Um, mm. uh, but I learned a lot from it and, you know, and subsequently, um, 
you know, just kept doing that. Uh, yeah. So I've just been kind of chipping away at it for more than a decade. It's, and it's, 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 sorry, sorry. Okay. on you go, sorry. Yeah. That it's funny that, um, you know, you say that you didn't have, you, you were kind of up against these folk who had like MAs and stuff in English, lit degrees, etc. cetera. But um, I mean, we've chatted to so many folk and there's such a massive variety of, you know, backgrounds and some folk have done the the whole literary scene. They've gone through university, done all those all the exams and subjects that you'd think you'd you'd have to do. And then folk who have, like yourself have done nothing related to writing at all, but then have come in and just and and gone it from the other end. And I think there's something to be said about there's no well, I think one, there's no right or wrong way of doing it, and two, I think not doing the writing courses can perhaps maybe bring a different perspective that you know a real world perspective or just something you're not taught something that maybe is maybe a bit a bit you know a bit separate or different than people yeah. who are taught in university I, th I think i think there's definitely something to be said for that but there, there's a, a fear that i guess if you if you are taught a certain structure then you're going to work to that structure whereas um, um you know my process is a little bit more organic maybe um, and and a little bit more you know didactic i've kind of i've kind of taught myself over a long yeah. time my mm -hmm. the, all these different schools of thought which is probably not as robust as someone going through and learning all those things in a in a in and, and being able to choose pick and choose those frameworks but but at the same time it, it's allowed me to not feel um i don't know not, not not feel particularly bound to any one structure any one any one school of thought about how my writing should work i, I just do you know do the way i enjoy it um and, and part of that is the freedom of just being like, I think there was a large element of that. You know, if you look at my earlier, but a lot of it is more literary fiction in terms of short fiction. Um, and a lot of that was actually about, I wasn't necessarily writing for myself. I was writing, I was writing to audience. I was trying, I was trying yeah. to, you know, put, put forward this sort of more literary fiction serious yeah, um, yeah. thing. And actually that wasn't what I wanted to be doing. It was what I thought you were meant to be doing. Yeah. And, um, and that wasn't, you know, didn't really work for me especially for longer form stuff was when i flipped around and started focusing on my own stuff but but i find it really fascinating because i do you know there's all these different people and they all come from very different paths to get there the main thing that seems to everyone seems to have in common is more about um sticking with it as opposed yeah. to as opposed to you know they did a certain degree of it i mean and i think those those courses can be incredibly valuable I and mean, they can be valuable in terms of giving you a tool set to work with you know or giving you space to focus on a project but mm -hmm. you know I, I, I certainly yeah i mean from my experience it wasn't a unnecessary well who knows if i'd done that maybe i would have published a decade ago and i'd be um you know i'd have sold a lot of my books <laughs> <laughs> although it's interesting what you say there about you know that you were writing to to market almost originally which is you know often what people say not to do in terms mm -hmm. of being a writer um, but I, I've always thought that there is a there has to be a balance struck there because unless you are uniquely talented in terms yeah. of you know you can write whatever type of story you want and you it's going to attract the right attention you have to have some eye on how where am I going to get this published if that's the goal of the writing if you know sometimes yeah. you just want to write a story that's fine but if you want it published, then you have to have some eye on the market. I would have thought. I, th I, th I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think it's um, it's a weird thing though, isn't it? Because because it's it can be such a, especially when you're starting out, it can be such a, a time-consuming thing, and it's something which you're doing with no reward. You know, yeah. you like, and and I can look back on, a, pretty much a decade of, short getting short stories published, where you know every year you're getting a, a handful published. The amount of money I made from all of that is less than you know <laughs> you'd make in a month of working any other yeah, job, yeah. Uh, and and the amount of time I put into that, but but the outputs I got from that, the you know the little journals where it's like, oh yeah, that was me and, that, and these other people, and and the connections you make from that, and the networks you build for it. And uh, I mean, in terms of doing it to market, though, sorry, I, I completely digress there. No, um, uh, in terms of yeah, I, I find it interesting now because. I, I do have a slightly more of an eye on the market, but I think there's a degree of self awareness you can bring where it's like it's like, well, yeah, yeah there are all these different markets out there. And then there's also the stuff I want to do that will fit in with our market. Like Yes. Like, uh -huh. you, you know, unless you're writing something incredibly inaccessible and weird. In which case there's probably a market for that somewhere. Um it's but also as you said, like what is the why are you writing? So are you writing this because you want to because you enjoy the process, because it, it gives you some feedback to yourself is it totally. because you want to get it in front of other yeah. people or you know what's your actual end goal there 
Yeah, 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 um, yeah absolutely. And yeah. I mean, am I right in saying that during this time, is this before your first book came out, which we'll get to in a sec, but your first, before your first book came out, you entered the Radio 4 opening lines uh, competition yeah, yeah. And, and, and won that? Yeah, yeah, uh, that was great. I was back um, in 2014, so I'd been down in London for a couple of years, and um, and I was in the middle of my PhD, and I and I kind of entered into that without much um, uh, hope. But I, I, that was another thing I was doing. I was just entering, you know, every. I guess I was just trying to build my CV, you know, because yeah. what you what you what you want to do is go to an agent, you know, and say, "Here's my cool book," and you want them to say, "Oh my God, I love this. This is wonderful," and then. Sell, sell it off. But in order to make them even begin to take that seriously or to overlook the crap first chapter, you know, you want a couple of things in your CV uh, which which say, you know, no, no, this person, you know, please give them 10 seconds yeah. of your day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and, and so my theory was that the more publications I could get, the more kind of like, no, he was in this journal and this journal mm -hmm. and one this thing and shortlist this thing. All of that stuff is adding a little bit of um, credibility, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the opening line thing, that, that was great it was um it was followed by a couple of years of no one touching any of my stuff i, I couldn't get a short story anywhere just to um, make sure your head didn't get too big yeah yeah you? but it was um it was lovely actually because um uh you know i got they they i went into the studio while they were doing the recording and did a little interview with them and kind of did the nice. whole the, the whole thing and they had a really nice production of it and actually um, um some students uh did like a student film of it um uh, so some like film students at Oxford Brookes University That's um, cool. about a year later you know got in touch and were like oh can we use this we heard this story in the radio and you know can we use this um, for a short That's film amazing. we did like a, a, you know which is so cool you know and again it's this sort of stuff where it's like, I, don't make any, I think I made a couple of hundred quid from winning that competition but I was on Radio 4 That's so cool yeah, yeah. exactly exactly yeah. and so did all of this I, I'm not sure you know in terms of the order of where the novel came in and stuff but when you were getting these short stories published when you were winning that competition things like that did, did you were you looking for an agent at all during that time <laughs> or did that only come around when you started writing the novel um so so i was looking for an agent throughout that period because i was trying to pitch a different novel um, right okay. um, which was you know a very uh a slightly weird um, i mean i think realistically i'd read Every book Ian Banks had, uh, Ian Banks had ever written, mm -hmm. and and had made a crap Ian Banks novel, you know, um, and but which I was really hyped about, um, and and so I, I basically went through every, you know, I bought one of those art. I mean, but you have to remember this was a decade, a good decade ago. Yeah. Um, like I used to walk around with a kind of you know street map in my pocket. This is this is on the cusp of pre-smartphone, um, mm -hmm. which is which is horrifying. But, you know, so I had one of these um, Writers and Arts Yearbook, which we publish yeah. every year, which has the kind of email addresses of all the different agents in it and postal addresses and how they take queries. And I, I'd literally just sit down and kind of I was posting some of these out and, and, um, and mailing out. And it was, just, you know, send the first three chapters of this. this quite bad novel, um, which was, uh, yeah, very weird. Um, but so I was looking for all of this for, for through all of that time. I was and, and but, you know, I was also working. I was doing a PhD. I was... Um, I was, uh, you know, living my life. So it was it was very much peaks and troughs. I'd have a few months where I'd get really, and you know, I'd do a new edit on that novel, and then I'd send it out to a dozen agents, and then I'd never hear back from any of them. And um, and a typical you know, experience. And then, yeah, and, and then a year later, and then I get very depressed about it, and I'd write some short stories. They get published a year later, and I just I think I got stuck on that novel for years because mm -hmm. it, it I, I I liked it. I still like it. It's just you know I, I understand now. Um, I guess it comes back to what we're talking about. Who's it for? You know, like there's not really a market for that. Um, the way I'd written it, it was it was a bit too heavy on the fantasy to be uh, literary fiction. It was a bit too um, heavy on literary fiction to be fantasy. It was a bit too shit to be um, so you know <laughs> people who want to read books and pay money for them. Um, so it, it's um, yeah, but so I spent a long time um, basically chasing a variety of agents. Actually, the agency I ended up signing with, um, I did try and pitch. A, a full decade ago, uh, I went back and found in my emails. I sent them, you know, like, oh, here's the first three chapters of my book. And then, you know, uh, I hope you like them. And n never heard anything back. And then, you know, a, a full decade later, I, was, I went back to them like, oh, you know, here's here's this book. And then, and, and now that's that's my agency. So it's, um yeah, it, it, it's a weird, it's it's a weird feeling. But, but it, 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 when I think about it in that sort of sense, it, 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 it's weird that I've spent a, a full decade 
going through that. And and now I do things so differently. If I could go back to and speak to myself 10 years ago and be like, you know, actually, here's what you should be doing over the next yeah. decade. Yeah. yeah. But, but at the same time, no complaints. I've got like, you know. So, I mean, what, what was it that made you realize in your head to give up on that first book and to say, actually, this book isn't working? And, and, and how did you work out what to fix? Because obviously your next book was one that got you got an agent yeah. through. Um, the first book I realized wasn't working because no one wanted to publish it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that I was really a little did, hint there, but I, okay. I, really, I really did try everyone. I mean, it's, no. it's, you say that, but it's funny how... You know, if you believe in your story, it's funny how long yeah. you'll battle to oh, say totally, someone yeah, wants yeah. this. It's psychologically, exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's an interesting one also, um, you know, in terms of, because you do have to battle through that, even with the ones that are successful, like people, yeah, the, the, totally. the one which, did, you know, did get published and got me the deal for that trilogy, um, uh, it was rejected by a bunch of people as well. Yeah. It was rejected by a bunch of agents as well. And so it's, there is this weird thing where, like, you can't tell what's being rejected because, hmm. oh, it didn't quite get the right person or, you know, it's not quite right at this moment and what got rejected because it's not yeah. very good. Um, I think I had a few people over that time, I, I, I had a few people kind of give read it and give me edits and things like that. And the general response was like, yeah, prose is very good. No idea what the fuck is going on. And it's not very accessible. And, um, you know, it's a bit dark. And so I... I just, I just sort of realized. I also, it was in terms of that literary fiction thing, and like it, it was a book which was portraying something which I, I don't think it was as every year, every kind of six months, I'd go back to it, I'd be like, I'd realize it was stupid, um, to a different degree, and I still think, oh, the core of it works, but like that level stupid. Oh, the core of it works, this level stupid, and you're, you're slowly winnowing down until you basically got a, a pretty small core of it where it's like, yeah, that's quite a good idea. And it's like, yeah, but you've got three quarters of a novel built around it, which is not very good. And also technically, I think I improved a lot um, over that decade of writing short stories. Mm -hmm. You know, I um, I tried a lot of different forms. I, I, I spent a lot of that, I feel like five or six years, I was in a, um, you know, creative writing group and doing uh, feedback to one another and all that sort of thing. Um, some of it with that book. Um, and, and all of that meant that my kind of technical skills at the end of that period compared to the beginning when I wrote that, when I started writing that book, were, were so different but I just felt you know um uh, it was time to put that away and and also I just realized I'd, I'd had a couple of years where I hadn't actually written anything new long form I'd just mm -hmm. been writing short stories and I wanted mm -hmm. to write novels you know and and, and so I just figured chuck it in a drawer and it's, it's not it's going to disappear you know and um, you can always come back to it in a few years I might come back to it in a few years who knows <laughs> it might be great my so age, age like something that ages well so so uh, how did the, the the gauntlet and the fist beneath then get picked up what was the what was the story there this one um well basically that was when i realized it was like it's not happening for me it's not it's not going to be a goer no one's going to buy my novel um but i do still really enjoy writing so i just decided i'm going to write something entirely for myself um i'm not going to worry about you know trying to look smart or doing it. i'm just going to be like what what are the books i actually enjoy reading and what i actually enjoy reading is super heavy dewy fantasy like like really over the top old school 80s like i, I love 80s fantasy I, yeah. I love you know um proper heroic fantasy and, and all the different permutations and everything i read i read a lot of but i was reading i was reading a hell of a lot of fantasy and then i was writing literary fiction and i was only reading a little bit of literary fiction mm -hmm. and actually so i just flipped it and skewed it so i was you know focusing instead on on what i was actually spending my time doing um and so i just decided to write it Kind of for myself and i set myself um i was like no i'm gonna write that i was actually a chinese medieval interview i was reading from right. decades ago where uh someone asked him about his advice on for new writers and what to do and he just said you know what 120,000 words free act structure go for it write a fancy novel like don't try and do anything fancy don't try and you know have time jumps and do this and make a five book series or anything like that just do a just sit, sit down, make, you know, and, and I, so I took that. I'm a scientist, so I sat down and made myself an Excel document and then um, made myself some tables and graphs. And I was like, well, it's, it's 120,000 words, then I'm going to want, you know, I, I literally got into the kind of minutiae of like, well, how long are like average fantasy chapters? How does all this work? Yeah. And I got a little bit more into that side of things. I made myself a little outline where I was like, yeah, I'm just going to write a fantasy novel. And I gave myself, and, you know, I, I then had, I just had so much fun writing it and putting it together. Yeah. And um and then so I wrote it over the course of about a year. Uh spent about six months trying to uh sell it and pitch it to agents, got nothing, not a hint, not a um oh no, got one guy 
one guy who uh, <laughs> was was like kind of into it um and kept on saying like yeah yeah maybe yeah maybe send me the next version of it you know and speak in a couple of months and so i worked really hard for a couple of months and send it to him and then you know a month later he'd be like yeah i'm not sure if now is the right time and, <laughs> and so, so I eventually ended up like i realized it was like oh well oh, but that guy did me a huge favor because it meant that i worked so hard on it yeah, i worked like a dog because yeah. i thought that it was yeah you know within reach. there yeah yeah um yeah. and then i yeah i didn't sell it and i decided to put it in a drawer and uh go away and um and actually i was, I, I was uh planning a big trip and doing all this and i was like oh I'll, I'll revisit it in a year or so maybe uh but you know it was fun while i did it um and then COVID happened and the big trip i was planning uh ended up getting cut short and i was at home unemployed and with a, a lot of spare time and so i was um uh dicking around on twitter and i saw that uh head of zeus were launching a new imprint and they, they announced, you know, we've, we've got a new imprint and new editor there. It was Holly, uh, they were launching Ares, which was their kind of action adventure imprint and a lot of historical fiction. And because they were launching a new imprint, they were like, yeah, we're going to do an open call for submissions. Don't worry about it. And so I just, you know, sent a message on Twitter. Um, and, but it was saying like, oh, it's for action adventure thrillers. So I sent this pitch, which was a complete load of shit, like complete <laughs> lies. I was like, oh, yeah, this is kind of like, it's fantasy, but it's more like Michael Crichton, kind of like, you know, like really pacey thriller. It's not at all. Nice. But, um, but I just said that to kind of get them to open it and read it. Um, yeah. But um, and Holly loved it, and you know, and and they ended up switching me on to because they then launched a you know by the time I got to publication, they'd launched a a sci-fi fantasy imprint um, at Astra, which is where I am now. But yeah, mm -hmm. um, but it was one of those things where it's like, yeah, I just got the book in front of the right person, and that yeah. was after six months of getting it in front of wrong people. Um. So it, and I very easily, if I hadn't done that, I could have put that in a, in a drawer and sat on it for a year and or I could be right now still sending that out and trying to get it published so it feels like it feels like luck but at the same time it's it's luck after you know yeah a, a decade plus of working yeah, around it so that I mean point. yeah the, so, so a, I, <laughs> yeah you'd put in the, the work to get the, the book to that that stage but the, there's always I think with everyone we've spoken to there is that element of just timing and yeah. finding yeah. the right person at totally. the right time. You know, if you hadn't seen that tweet, what would have happened? Who knows? But you, you know, you know, everyone I know, ever like if I think back to the kind of um, that writing group I was in when I was about twenty-two or whatever, and all the people I know from that, there's oh, there were maybe twenty, thirty people in that group who rotated in and out over a kind of four or five year period, and a handful of them are now you know full time writers, professional writers, and the ones who are doing it are the ones who just stuck with it and kept doing it, yeah. and just and just eat over. Years and years, and you know, because if you'd spoken to me three years ago and be like, "Oh, yeah," you know, and I had this, I have like family members and friends be like, so "How's the how's the writing thing going? You won any more uh, prizes?" And be like, "Nope, I haven't won a prize in a few years. And, uh, I haven't published anything recently, and uh, no one wants to buy my book." Um, but you know, you just have to kind of keep going. If, yeah. you, if you want it to happen, you just totally. have to. Totally. You know, and if you enjoy the process, it's. Um, so, so, so did you? So did. Uh, Head of Zeus then pick up the book directly without an agent. Then did you get an agent once you got an offer from them? Essentially, it was kind of contemporaneous. Um, it was a bit weird because I had still a couple of outstanding uh, submissions to agencies. Um, a couple of agents who'd, who'd been like, "Oh, we want to look at this and take a bit more time." Mm -hmm. um, and and but during that, I saw this and I was like, "Well, you know, I'll do." And, and then so Head of Zeus came and we were like, "Yeah, we're interested. We want to do this." And at the same time, I was speaking to agents who were like, yeah, we're maybe interested in this. So then I was able to sort of go to, a, I had three different agents and I was able to go to them and say, you know, who I was in the process of talking to. And I was able yeah. to say like, actually, I've got this deal now. Yeah. Um, you know, so, which was then interesting, like, do you then need an agent? Do you then choose to have an agent? So the reason I went with them, uh, you know, the agent, so my agent, uh, Oliver Cheatham, um, at the Cheatham agency. And, um, you know, the reason I went I, I, in the end, I, I didn't just say, yeah, go for it. Um, I, I said, no, I want I want to work with you. I want to, you know, because I wanted to work long term. I don't I don't want to publish free books and then yeah, disappear. I want to do this for the next decade, the next 20 years, you know. Yeah. And and he's someone where he can help me make sure that, you know, this first trilogy lands in such a way that I'm set up to do more and more and, and keep going on. And, and he and so he brings that, that very kind of level head and a sort of long distance view on everything because i'm very reactive and uh excitable um but he's uh, yeah so it, it's a uh, so it, it was weird though to to kind of i i 
in the course of a couple of days, I went from having no agent and no book deal to having an agent and a <laughs> yeah. book deal. And I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> it was very, very confusing. And was the when the you were having that initial you know conversation with Head of Zeus about this book and stuff, and they made you, made, they made you the offer? Was it an offer for one book? Or was it an offer for three? Because it's a trilogy that you're writing now, and was that the plan well, at the start? Well, I can say this now because um, you know the third book's written, and, and it's all it's all it's all, it's all, it's all, it's all fine. No, they, um, I mean, what I didn't want to do was waste three years of my life I, when I, when I was just writing it and had no one to publish it. I was yeah. like, I'm going to write one book, and it's and it works as a book. Yeah. I did have a plan for it to be a trilogy. Obviously, you know, the market works in a way where publishers love trilogies. They love that mm-hmm. good. Um, it's a good, I think, investment risk combination for them. You know, like like they, they can invest in you for three years, four years or whatever it is worth of marketing, publicity, all of that. It will all feed into each other. But if it doesn't work, they're not tied into you for a decade. You mm-hmm. know, so, so, so whereas one book, they put all that money into marketing and then you disappear, you know, but, yeah. and so I, I get why they like that. I like I like trilogies because I'm a fantasy nerd who doesn't like a trilogy. Um, uh, uh, but so I had I did have a trilogy plan. It was um, and I had a plan for the first book, and then I had one A4 page which had was cut in half and had book two, book three, and a couple of bullet points. And so um, uh, you know they I think I think the 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 phrase when you're submitting a book, which I've heard is the the one to always stick in is um, stand alone with series potential. Yes. Yeah, nice. Because yeah. like then you know when, when, when we say like, yeah, we just want one book, you're like, yeah, of course it works as one book. Fine. Yeah, <laughs> I always yeah, say no, it was no one drama. book. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. More than one book would be you know frivolous. Um, but as soon as as soon as they say, did you think this could work as a series? You're like, oh yeah, yeah, I've got that planned out. You, <laughs> yeah. you don't need to see the plan, but here's an opaque folder that says plan on it. You know, great, <laughs> yeah. let's do it. And when you were given that was the approach that you took where you had the first book planned and some ideas for the second and third books when it came to actually writing the follow-up books did you find it easier or harder than the first book where you did you find yourself sort of boxed in by the decisions that you'd made in the first book as you were writing the other ones to an extent but um my process is very especially fantasy is very much world building driven Mm -hmm. and so it was less boxed in it was more like that's how the world works that's how it's put together. like like this this you know but there were certain decisions i made in the first book where it's like oh that does close doors for the the other yeah. books but also every, every, i spent a lot of time building the world and then i i mean there's a tolkien quote which i always get wrong about you know you, you should draw the map before you write the book because you're never going to write the book you're never going to draw the map afterwards and if you have the map at the start then then you're like oh well my characters need to go from here to here and it's like well that's going to take like four days you can't mm-hmm. just have it happen in the next scene you, and that adds a layer of believability and that kind of um mm-hmm. and so i really like build world building from that perspective trying to add in these different layers of believability and so i did a huge amount of world building and i had a massive world building document and um and all like you know a mixture of this horrible melange of like notebooks and um uh chop uh, not chop cork boards and like, like I look like someone who's hunting a serial killer in a fancy <laughs> world like, like and 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 Excel documents that don't really make sense to anyone except me um but because I'd done all that world building and then but actually for the second book I was just like well you know what's the natural I know my big overarching yeah. plot um I know what's going on I can just pick up there and and even um the end of the third book there was a whole element there was something I was trying to um reconcile i was like well how do you how does this work how does how could how does this possibly work i've made myself a puzzle and then i just i went away and read my world building document for a couple of days and was like oh right yeah no actually i set this up in book one i said i like I, because the world is internally consistent it means yeah. that you don't have those those troubles I, I, I more find it interesting from the writing the second book is great fun because the second book you get to introduce all the new shit you you get to go like oh well, you like that here's a little bit more depth here's some weirder edge mm-hmm. stuff Here's a new place. Here's like the the characters you like, but new situation. You get to throw more in. The third book is where I struggle a little bit more because the third book, you you want to keep doing that and you want to keep putting more in, but you also have to tie off absolutely yeah. everything, you know, yeah. in a satisfying yeah. way from two books now. Um, but but someone um I can't remember who it was. Uh, yeah, sorry. So, some someone told me the advice of like anyone who reads the third book of your series, like they're in. They're, they're if, if you're reading book three of a series. You're here. You're here. Yeah, that's you, right. you, you, yeah. you, you, you want to yeah. see the like, like. So don't worry about putting in slightly weirder stuff, or um, just, just have fun with it. So I've been trying to. I mean, it, it, 
it definitely sounds to me like the the world creation aspect of the fantasy books is something that you really do enjoy and it's, it's funny because that's a whole other step that so many other genres don't have to deal with you know if you write your book in the modern day as a crime book or literary fiction or romance novel you don't have to worry at all about building this whole other world and it's a, it's a whole other mental step that, that people a lot of folk would never have to think about yeah and but i think i think what's what's interesting is that um so so i find it really fascinating because you 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 do do that you just you're you're relying on the reader's own knowledge so i i found that living in um scotland some of the rebus books for example the mm-hmm. um, the um or ian rankin books you know yeah. all set in Ed- edinburgh crime novels all almost all set in edinburgh if you know edinburgh even in a passing way the world building in those books feels so much more alive because you're filling in all those blanks yourself. Yeah. Um, whereas if you if you've never been to Edinburgh before, then I, I, I don't know. I, I find it impossible to know what someone's experience with those books would be compared totally, to mine. Like, yeah. like I do. I can't unpick what the world building is like in those books because I've been to Edinburgh. Same with you know different cities around the world, different places. Whereas in fantasy um, setting, you're actually. It, I, what I found weird is you're actually kind of playing against this this people's expectations of what a fantasy book. And mm-hmm. fantasy setting is because there's an expectation that you're talking about, you know, oh, it's Middle Ages. It's essentially um, 12th century Europe with the serial numbers filed off. And like, <laughs> actually, and people assume that and so people fill in the blanks. And so you have to be careful that if you have anything which is not that, you have to quite overtly state it. You know, like there's a whole section of um, uh, the government. Because there's, there's a shit ton of crocodiles and swamps. You know, which are not um, yeah. particularly common in Western Europe. You know, you know, mm-hmm. like like the the flora and fauna and all of it is not uh, a copy across. The cultural stuff is not a copy across. There, there are some elements which are familiar purely because that's roughly the tech level I chose to go for. But um, and so so that was part of the fun challenge for me was being like, I want to build a world that makes sense in and of itself, but is not just that sort of uh, you know carbon copy. Um, yeah. yeah. But there were certain things I wanted to do, which you know, like, like I wanted a lot of um, uh, kind of Scottish landscape stuff. So I wanted to. So the where, where the first book is set, it, it's kind of geographically commensurate to Scotland in terms of I wanted somewhere which is basically the end of the world and a bit hardcore in terms of its um, you know, you know, it, it's pissing down with rain and there's big rocks everywhere. But, but um, and and how does that impact the? the way people behave because i think there is something to be said for you know you go to the west coast of the north of scotland and you look out of the sea and you're just like well that's that's it there's nothing else ever again it's just <laughs> it's just sea forever and and yeah. and how does that impact the culture of the people when you exist at the end of the world you know um, yeah. uh, when you were when you were first sitting down to write the story then did you you know did you start writing the story and build as you went, or did you build the whole world out before you then started writing the story? What um, was the process there? I had a couple of very key. I knew what the so the 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 story was based on a couple of um key kind of aesthetic building blocks. Um, so I was actually the idea for it came to me when I was, I was researching a different story about uh, historical UFO sightings, and so I, and I, and I and I also been watching this uh, very trashy. Kind of brilliant film, uh, Cowboys vs. Aliens. Oh, like, yeah. Which, yeah. Daniel which Craig is like, Ford's yeah. oh, classic movie. Superb. Right. And I was, <laughs> was kind of like, man, why is there not? Why? Also, there's a really there's a really bad Transformers film uh, recently. Just one? Um, well, <laughs> uh, but, but there's one scene where basically the Transformers are, there's like a Transformer in the shape of a dragon or whatever, messing up a bunch of medieval knights. It's a terrible film, um, which I didn't finish. But that one scene was just like, I, you know, I love I love that kind of clash of technology. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and so uh, the, the, while I was doing this research, I came across this cool wood cutting from um, Nuremberg in the 1560s, uh, which is about a UFO sighting over Nuremberg. And it's this brilliant wood cutting of, um, of like a medieval German town. Uh, and then over the top, there's just all these fucking crazy lights and all, and all these cool. all these villages you saw. And it, it kind of made me think, you know, your medieval level soldier, knight, whatever, up against the UFO phenomena, you know, like, like a orb of light comes through the sky, abducts your cattle, steals your children. How do you even begin to mm-hmm. deal with that? Um, and so that's really, that was the seed, the initial seed was kind of like UFO. And, and that then molded into, because I then started thinking about 
the world and like how does that world exist where you have these two disparate levels of technologies and i wanted to do um you know there's a few things i wanted to do i wanted to do a um i wanted to do a sympathetic junta uh because i, I don't know i just thought it seemed like a fun thing to do. <laughs> I, was, I, I was really interested to kind of try and do a very militaristic society but to try and make them still the good guys and be like yeah. how, how do you how do you make the like hardcore militaristic assholes how do you make them actually the good guys um uh and then uh you know i wanted to i wanted to do this also i wanted to make a setting which was um uh had a lot of basis in animism and um and kind of place spirits and stuff like that and so that then fed into the whole magic system which fed back into the ufo thing so i spent a long time on the world building connecting all of these together drawing maps pulling this all together and i, I knew the core of it i had this like central image of this this woman whose child gets abducted and um and she has to find them and that's you know that's a very simple story it's a very um it's a very simple understandable motivation you know it's a very strong motivation to push character forward it's just you know your child's been kidnapped then you'll do anything so you mm -hmm. you go and um yeah and then I, and then i just had an absolute blast once i put all those pieces in place and it was just like yeah because then you're like cool i need to do my abduction scene i need i need this i need to set up this little village and then i need to have ufos come burn the place down steal the children this is great fun you know i mean is that see if you're writing a book like that where it's it's kind of a whole new world that you're having to take people through and you've got all these new technologies or magic systems and you've got kind of different you know structures and social hierarchies yeah. etc and it's all this brand new stuff is it is it important then to have a kind of a simple through line of a story so people can can, can latch onto that and say right even if i don't quite get yet how the world works i can i'm following this simple thread of a story and i'm learning as i go i think that's i think that's a very good point i think that's probably true i'm sure it's possible to do much more complicated you know political machinations at the same time i don't think i don't know if i'm the person to do that um most of my stories seem to involve someone hitting something else with something sharp um <laughs> but um no i, I do I, I think one thing that's also really valuable to do is to use someone as a proxy for the reader um so um so what one of my early beta readers uh was like yeah this is lovely lovely and you've done it but the thing is the way i like doing world building is all for subtext and inference i, I like i don't really like overtly stating like and yeah. this is how this works i prefer having like three minor items happen and then the reader like puts it together in my mind like oh that must be how that works um but one of my one of my beta readers was like look just and that that's fine that's a great approach but at some point in this 120,000 word novel, you need to have one person just tell someone else what is going on. Yeah. Just, just, <laughs> like, 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 just, just one, like halfway through the book, maybe, you know, have one of your characters just some say, sorry, sorry, so sorry, I, I don't get it. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, and so luckily I had some some characters who were less worldly who could just be like, wait, so why, why are we doing this? And it's like, no, it's because this, this, and you can just state it, you know, find an excuse idea, yeah. to, yeah. Um, and so, I've, I've, so yeah, um, uh, that that saved it. I always makes <laughs> me think of that scene bit... in um, Event Horizon when it's near, near, near the start and like they're kind of they're all meant to be like scientists, or whatever. And this one guy's like, "What is a black hole?" And, they, and Sam Neill like explains basically what the, how the whole plot yeah, yeah. is. I'm like, even, even though you should know this already, it's obviously <laughs> oh, yeah. just for the audience's point of view. And it's, but it's great. It's, it's like you know what? It's like thirty seconds dialogue. We need this. We're yeah. all up speed now, and all that now we can just go for it. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, but 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 finding balance there is like when do you place that in you know because if you put that in too early and it's just exposition then people are going totally, to patch yeah, up yeah. So you have to kind of hook people in a little bit of character or action and then then you can you know maybe do a little bit more it's, it's yeah totally. yeah but but it but it is it's valuable yeah. um and i was i was going to ask because you said obviously you were attracted to the sort of classic uh sort of high fantasy i guess um but a lot of modern fantasy that is published now and that people watch on tv and stuff is you know it's all about being grounded it's about being gritty there's there's fewer elves and dwarves and more um you know dead and naked people um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 why why do you think that is and do you think sort of the more classic fantasy still has has a place i do i think um it's become a bit of a shorthand um in terms of having you know you've got cool fantasy and cool fantasy is where everyone's sexy and, and naked and dead and it's all you know it's all it's all everyone's morally gray and everyone's you know and it's all and everything's driven by murder and sex 
It's like, well, no, also there's there's magic and dragons. Like, like yeah, there, yeah. There, those are the four forces. It's just those four things. But um, it, it's, <laughs> sometimes it's magic and dragons. And I, I don't know. I, I found I found that actually really interesting um, with the kind of recent uh, rings of power compared to, um, yeah. say, Wheel of Time or the um, uh, Game, of, the Game of Thrones, House yeah. of the Dragon. Yeah, totally. Where yeah. you know, just say that. you've got Rings of Power does what Tolkien does very well in that way. Mm-hmm. And and I do think Rings of Power managed to capture this. Where it's just like, no, this is you know. This is high level story shit. This is, you know, good versus evil. And there are nuances and there is so much interesting stuff to be done there. But not everything has to be that same aesthetic of, um, you, you know, if you look at the, the Wheel of Time adaptation, The Witcher, um, the new uh, Willow adaptation, any of these things, like the aesthetic on all of them is so kind of cut and paste. It's just mm-hmm. like, and, and it's not even accurate. If you actually go back to, um, the middle, I know it's not accurate in a fancy world, the places we're drawing inspiration from, you know, the places we are potentially pseudo medieval versions of, there was a hell of a lot more color and interesting stuff going on. It wasn't all just brown. It's not all just like the yeah. world is not this grim, dark nightmare. If you actually go out, the vast majority of people you meet in the world are pretty nice people trying to like live the life. Like not every village is just full of, you know, sadism and darkness. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I, I think it's, um, it's interesting. I, so a couple of people have called my books uh, grim, dark. Um, in reviews, um, I think just because they're very violent, mm-hmm. um, but it is mainly it's you know it's goblin-based violence, <laughs> and, and, and I think there's something to be said for you know, I don't know it's it's that weird thing of like Mortal Kombat where they could um, they could include loads of blood, but only when it was green. I think. Was that Mortal yeah, Kombat? yeah, um, yeah, 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 you, you know, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's like you know it's fine to watch an orc get his head chopped off, but it's not fine to watch you know person get their head chopped off that's very very different and um and i think that is different and i think one of the things actually in this in this book is about like the way you treat different enemies the way you treat you know a human enemy compared to a monster you know and what and when is the line it's like well these people live with the monsters so can we treat them the same way we treat the monsters like you know it's yeah it's this nuance of you know when are you allowed to treat someone as properly evil and a monster and when are you when do you have to be a little bit more nice to them? um but yeah i i i find it interesting i, I mean i think mine probably have elements of both um maybe to its detriment but um you know, you know i because I, I like the i like the more grounded version in terms of like yeah let's talk about um blacksmithing and let's talk about what kind of what kind of food everyone's eating and, and where's the bathroom and all that kind of stuff but i i don't necessarily think that that groundedness has to be just you know torture and sexual violence and yeah. um you know it, and it's, it's like these fantasies you these fantasy universes where it's like oh every and every single one of them it's like yeah the patriarch is still awful and you know sexual violence is still incredibly prevalent and all that we that's something we couldn't imagine away we couldn't possibly do a fantasy <laughs> universe where where that wasn't the case it's like everyone's still mean to gay people but you know it's it's like and so that that really bums me out i just i don't i don't see the need to when it's you know you're making a society from whole cloth you don't necessarily have to copy and paste every negative element for our there's, i think it's important that there are negative elements but they don't necessarily have to be the same ones that we have. And and I think that can be interesting um, to play with. Is Grimdark Fantasy a fairly new thing then? I mean, I'm not a massive kind of fantasy video, so this is kind of a, still quite new stuff to me, but is it is Grimdark Fantasy quite newish? Is it, or, or is, there, is there stuff that's like, you know, kind of Tolkien age, like think, Grimdark stuff? I, not that I know of. I think it is more newish. It's more of a, from my understanding, it's more of the last, last 15, 20 years where some fantasies have, have like really lent into you know really dark stuff uh, yeah. and 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 just you know pretty relentlessly violent and awful nasty stuff happening to people um just that just happens to be in a uh, fantasy setting and you know it, it it's 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 interesting i think it, it does get applied kind of across the board whenever there's quite a lot of violence i don't think that's necessarily the same thing but i'm not i'm also i'm not a huge fan of these weird little terms where it's like oh is this fantasy grim dark or is it you know is it is it is it this is it high fantasy low fantasy or whatever. it's like like as soon as you start using and i know these are, are very useful in terms of reviewing and in terms of recommending and so on people to find books but it, it can be very um it can be quite weird to be lumped in with groups when you don't necessarily agree that that's where you should yeah. be yeah um, and often within the group they don't agree on how those groups should be defined so i, I tend to just ignore all that and just kind of do my own thing yeah very wise uh, so i in terms of in terms of your own books which uh the, the gauntlet it is, it's the rot storm trilogy but the gauntlet and the fist beneath gauntlet and the burning blade uh, the the last book is out uh this year 
uh, are you yeah, ex but... are you excited for for the trilogy to come to a conclusion? <laughs> Yeah, I'm freaked out to be honest. It's it's really weird, and um, it's a very weird feeling to kind of uh, be done with it. You know, I've got the because uh, I've spent a lot of time over the last because you know the the Gauntlet and the this beneath the first book came out two years ago, mm -hmm. um, but I wrote it kind of more than uh, probably two years before that because I wrote it for a year and then spent six months pitching it, and etc. Et so like actually, I've been dicking around in this specific world for about four or five years. And um, and by the time that third book comes out, it's a huge amount of, you know, it, it it it's 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 something I've put a lot of effort into, and and so the way it's received and the way it, it ties together, and 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 that it does work as a trilogy, and um, is something I'm really keen on getting right. Um, which is you know what I'm doing at the moment. I'm just doing final edits on the third book, um, but trying to make sure that it, it's satisfying in terms of you know you've got character arcs, you've got things which you set up in book one. You have to make sure that I want to make sure I don't leave anything. Yeah. Um. On the on the shelf. Um. But, uh. Yeah. I'm really excited. It's 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 fun. You know. It's 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 cool. It, it, it like it's 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 very cool to have like these books and see the the changes through them and um and stack them next to each other. It's uh. Yeah. I, I'm having a great. And in terms of the actual process, I mean, we've obviously touched on your process throughout throughout the chat, but <clears throat> when you're pulling together a, a multi book story i suppose um how d is your approach to things like editors notes any different like the editors give more leeway given that there's already been two books so there, there's i suppose less that they can they might want to change or are able to suggest changes yeah to. i mean I, I think they're a little bit locked into the changes they suggested last time so you know any anything that's in that's in the kind of until it's you know at the printers it's all all fair game but anything up until that point you know in theory they could change so there's there's things which changed in the first book which you know mm -hmm. um which is one of the reasons I, I found it um quite a little bit stressful because the way that those editor notes and things work is actually for me ideally i should be working on the next book whilst editing the previous book. yeah but the edits can be so substantial that it would really change what you've been doing next and what yeah. it's so what i should do is just you know start drafting and then i can fix whatever that changes later but i find that a little bit stressful and so i end up waiting until i've done the edits on the previous book before i kind of kick into heavy gear on the next one um yeah i i think it's it's been really useful to me um because uh, uh so holly who uh, signed on the trilogy in the first place and um, subsequently left head of zeus to kind of go freelance but they kept her on as my editor so uh j just to give me editorial notes and not to do any of the other stuff but mm. just because she's to give me a bit of consistency across the mm -hmm. trilogy and she's been fantastic really really so it's holly domini um, and she is really really good she gives me really brilliant notes and um, and i tend to draft quite um skeletally and then you know flesh out and 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 divert and grow up as um as i as i work through it in different iterations and she kind of understands my process as well and yeah so so i don't think i've the only difference is that there have been a few things on this third book where i'm like there are there are little things which I want to include, um, because it's the third book in the series and it's the final part of the series. Where you know I'm going to even if this isn't necessarily the perfect pacing thing, I want I really want this to be in there because um, I think it's important for the conclusion of the series. Yeah. But similarly, that um, she also points out a lot of stuff which is like, oh, it would be really nice to reference back to this thing that happened in book one, or you know whatever happened to these guys over here. And it's like, oh shit, yeah. Um, so it, it, it's it's not been massively different. It's just that it's more just just more to keep holding your head at one time by the time yeah, you get exactly. to book three. Yeah. There's a lot yeah. of uh, a lot of threads to kind of hopefully keep on top of. So, so I mean, once this, once you've, you're finished with book three and it's handed in and you're and you can step back from it, what's your plans? Are you, are you going to go back to, to the universe again? I mean, I'm assuming you could do some kind of grim dark shagathon through Middle Earth. <laughs> oh, to, oh you know. God, yeah, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the next thing. It's going to be, you know. Um, uh, Pure violence and filth. Um, <laughs> no, I, I actually. Um, so I, I don't think I'm meant to say what I'm doing next, but I am. But set up for what I'm doing next. But which um, is, which you can tell us, it just does. I can, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm. Um, so the, the next thing I'm working on is actually. Uh, so the next book will be a, a different thing entirely. There's going to be some near okay. future sci-fi. Um, oh, wow, cool. Um, yeah, because a lot of my short fiction was, you know, some was fantasy, some was literary, some was sci-fi, and so sci-fi is something I've always um, been working on. So it's actually going to be a, a sci-fi novel, a kind of standalone sci-fi novel, um, and nice. then 
and then you know more stuff i would say i spent a lot of time developing this world the idea of um <laughs> but uh yeah there's, there's a lot of if you look at the end um, the map of the world the kind of um which i think is in book two i've got the kind of big world map and, and all of the action in the first three books takes place in about the top eighth of the map yeah okay so there's it's a, a shame to let of... that Matt There's a lot, waste. a lot of space. Yeah, exactly. You know, right? that would just be wasteful. Um, but I've done a lot of world building around all that, all that stuff. Um, and and so there's a lot of scope for me to go back to in the future, um, as and when that's right to do. But it's uh, yeah, I've got a lot of uh, I've got a, a few notebooks full of things to do. You know, it's just um, nice. but it's weird because each one of these things, you know, you say, oh, I'll do that, and then it's like that is a year's work. That's a year of your life you yeah, need to totally. um, commit to. So you you need to really be sure that you uh, you quite like yeah. this idea before you jump on but yeah it's um uh should be sci-fi next which would be a nice uh change of pace the research has been very different for that yeah, yeah can imagine, can imagine. yeah uh, so i mean is that like have, have you started writing that one or is it a you know how, how long does the actual writing process take for you to 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 write mm. this novel um so i mean for, so for this trilogy and for the sci-fi one i'm kind of in one year contracts you know so so you you sign on and it's, and it's, and it's i will deliver a book in one year to you Mm -hmm. um, from when I sign on, roughly mm -hmm. uh, nine months or one year of that time, I don't know. I, I think it's it's this weird thing where I I find it very hard to understand or answer the question of how long does it take to write a book because basically it's as long as I have, I will I'll take. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's and right. and so um, you know, the first one I wrote in a year. Uh, but I was working full time and I was traveling a lot with work and doing all this. And so it was all in snatched moments and very intense writing together. And then I slowly edited it over six months. The next one I am, um, I was able to do full time. And, and so, so book two and book three, I was able to like focus and make that my kind of nine to five job doing that. Yeah. And so, and I still took a year to do each of them. I think the quality is better. I had to spend less time on the edits probably than I did on book one. Uh, the, the version that came out was a lot cleaner, a lot better. Um, you know, this next project I'm working on, I'm, I'm doing pretty good in kind of the first thrust of it. But, um, I, you know, I, I know that I will have to do substantial edits. So, so it's this kind of thing where it's, it's um, I think, realistically, uh, giving my, I, doing more than one in a year would be a huge amount of work and wouldn't really fit into, uh, you know, my life as it is right now. Yeah. Um, but d doing one in a year means it's something where, because you can have periods where you do, you know, you can have three months where you you can get the draft in three months. You can, um, you know, uh, but that's not necessarily a huge amount of words a day. It, but that draft will be total shit, and um, and and you'll then have to spend potentially three months, six months, nine months, yeah, revising it. How much, how long that takes depends on how much space you have mentally, how much you know space you have in terms of actual time. It, you know, if 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 you give me six months where i'm sat in a villa and someone is bringing me three meals a day and i don't need to you know um hoover the floor then i'll be able to give you a book um and it'll be pretty good if you give me nine months to do the same project I'll, it'll be even better you know i'd very happily you know take 10 years and oh, I, mean, I, I don't know like you could take 10 years and make it better i guess but, but there's this whole uh thing in my mind you know the idea that I guess it was the experience of that first novel where I had it and I was like, oh no, I'll just spend another year on it and kind of revise it. It's like, it didn't really get much better. You know, uh, mm -hmm. there's a, a point at which you're just putting work in you, or you're redoing work which you did the year before. You know, you're just yeah. dicking about with it. And it, you, what you have to do is, you know, is the core of it good? If the core of it's good, you can put some polish on it, it'll work. If the core of it's not any good, then, you know, you're in trouble. But, but I think, yeah, that timing thing is, is weird. It's a, uh, different per project as well yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. and that does include the world building time as well you know <laughs> exactly yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was the last book that you're in um so the last book i read um was uh 10 low no it wasn't no i finished that so the last book i read was the last book of the wheel of time series Oh, okay. Because um, I've been very slowly working my way through that <laughs> over the last like three or four years. Um, because I very I don't know I I decided not to kind of do it in a row because I thought I'd overdose on, you know, mm -hmm. with time and 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 start freaking myself out. So it, it it's been 
actually incredibly satisfying to just to just finish that and, and say you know that's a whatever is 13 14 book series nice. plus a prequel and novel um done and it's been such a looming presence in the back of my mind whenever i'm reading anything else it's just like oh i should, I should probably read that next week the time book um, yeah. and, so, and so now it's kind of it's kind of finished and, it, and, it's, and it's actually it's really interesting as well you know from a fantasy writer perspective to think about how world building is approached in that and how pacing is approached approached in that it's, it's a really uh pretty spectacularly uh dense world that's well, uh, yeah there. i mean i've heard i can't remember which books it is but they certainly I've, I've read a lot that says in the between books five and nine or something is quite a struggle to get through. See, kind of thing. I I didn't get that at all. I loved it. I loved it because, but then I'm a world building nerd, so mm. it was just like, oh, well, you know, book five, we're actually going to just spend, you know, six hundred pages on this coastal city, which has only been mentioned a few times before. You know, we're not even going to mention. There's like five main characters. Half of them aren't going to get a look in this book. We're just going to spend. It's like, yeah, great, let's do it. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I love that kind of stuff. You know, the, the idea the idea of having the time to luxuriate in your setting like that is mm-hmm. um it's, uh, uh quite attractive but um yeah it's uh, uh so that's the last that that's the last thing i read cool um, and what about the last film that you watched the last film that i watched um the, uh, so i i have a six-month-old baby um and so i haven't managed to watch a proper film <laughs> in, in a very long time the last film i watched was hercules um disney's nice. hercules nice. which stands up to an extent you know, yeah, I watched that gone. not too long ago actually. It's, it's, yeah, it was never one of the ones that I, as a kid I was too old for. It, I think when it came out, so I never really watched it. As yeah, a kid. it's not it's not got great great musical numbers to be honest. It's, um, Mulan, on the other hand, stands up incredibly well. Yeah, I, I have think, to say, and I think is a uh, Mulan over Hercules any day of the week. I yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah. So, so I haven't. Um, but there's a there's a huge list of um, um exciting and uh, culturally relevant films which I would love to watch and which I've not seen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that might also influence the next question, which is what was the last TV show that you watched or are watching? Um, I think it's Rings of Power. Um, right. Because, I, I, yeah, I haven't, um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. There's some people who like have kids and they're just, they're just like, oh, man, I watch so much TV. Uh, so, so much TV. Uh, my brain is not working at all. Um, and uh, and I just don't seem to manage that at all. So, um, yeah, Rings of Power is the last thing I watched, which I did enjoy. I'm a huge um, Tolkien nerd. And I, I know there's a lot of people who, didn't dig it and like the stuff in it which isn't great but you know it's... yeah no i i enjoyed it yeah i agree it was it was good but yeah there, there definitely was stuff that you thought mm, that wasn't the best but yeah overall but, you know, i enjoyed overall, it as a, yeah, as a I, story i would definitely Christ, i'm looking forward to the next series you know better than the hobbit i mean jesus yeah, <laughs> yeah <absolutely. laughs> gonna... i totally agree with that and we just about finished house of dragon and I'm loving House of Dragon for very different reasons. It's quite nice mm. having two yeah. very different fantasy shows that aren't just the same, you know. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and House of Dragon, I did enjoy House of the Dragon. Um, I, I did think it was one of those things where, you know, you, you, you're you sort of going through it and you're like, I I understand this. But I've read a lot of, you know, Song of Ice and Fire books. I've, and and, I've, and I'm, I've spent a lot of time on the internet, you know, re, 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 reading about Game of Thrones. So I'm um, like, I get this, I don't know. I'm like, how does a random so person... Bloody kind of... names, the bloody names are so similar. They're, they're, and they all rhyme. Is, it was like well, a, they, they, they're start, exact, the names are yeah. exactly the same. But which is, Jesus, but which is like sometimes. so fantastically accurate yeah. and good. Like, it's such good world building. The fact that, like, it's like, yeah, there's like 10 dudes named Steve. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is. It's terrible. It, it, you know, in a way, it's incredibly inaccessible writing because, you know, you're, you yell, you're yelling Steve and 10 guys are looking around. Um, or you're expecting characters to differentiate based on, yeah, but yeah. based on nothing. But uh, but it's fantastic world building. And, and in, in book form, I think it works wonderfully well. It's, you know, I don't know. I... I, I yeah, I, I, my my problem more with that was that I I just didn't there wasn't a single person in that entire series that yeah. where I, I I cared if they lived or died. It's like it's yeah, like they're all, they're all ev- horrible people. Everyone is yeah. uniformly awful. It's kind yeah, of like that's this. right. There's no like yeah. even in there's no hero character. The original yeah. series you had uh, yeah Ned uh, Stark or someone didn't you? yeah, yeah. Uh, or you or the I can't remember his name. John Snow's pal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but, you had uh, some good characters. Yeah. Yes, that. totally. There, yeah, there yeah. aren't well, any know, in, yeah. in House of the Dragon. And, and it's, all, it's all just, you know, it's like aristocrats arguing over who's going to yeah. be the next monarch. Yeah. It's like, yeah. you know, I'm just waiting for the peasant revolution to, you know, get rid of them all. It's, um, <laughs> but it's just very un- unrelatable. Um, but, you know, 
Uh, that that maybe leads us into the the very final part of the podcast, which is a, a quick fire either or. And uh, as you'll know, there's no right answer here apart from one, and that you might even know what the right answer is. But we'll start off with Tolkien or Sanderson. It's Tolkien. It's always okay. uh, TV or cinema. Uh, cinema. Night owl or early bird. Uh, night owl. Uh, I don't. I don't have my baby as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Music or no music when you're writing? Music, music, heavy music. And uh, and the the last and most important question, of course, real book or ebook? Now, I'm going to say ebook. Oh, oh. fantastic! I, 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 know, I know. Yeah, that's I'm one nil for the in the new year. That's that's the. I, that's the... I and this is because I um I honestly, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how anyone gets any reading done when we're reading. Oh, well, those fantasy books. books, man! They're like a thousand pages. You get like yeah. wrist like, strains and hold those. Yeah, if, if, I, if I'm carrying around, I mean, honestly, I was um because I was I was reading the last week the time book um and I was reading on my Kindle and I uh, went up to Aberdeen to visit my dad and he's he's a big Wheel of Time fan and he was like oh I've got the you know I've got the hardcover do you don't want to read it in my hardcover and I was like I don't want to carry <laughs> like a two, a two kilogram hardcover book on on the train like like for a like a that's about a third of the size of my back. Like, I, it, yeah. it's so, and also, I just the the volume at varying points. Um, I've read, you know, you just end up accruing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books, and then you have to kind of find a way to distribute them again. Yeah. And 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 I either you like you, I feel awful throwing books away. Um, a lot of the charity shops near me don't even take books anymore. They're just they're just like, yeah, no, we've got no no space for them. Yeah. Um, and so. I end up, you know, having secrets. I don't know. I end up having like secret little piles of paperbacks tucked under my bed, so my wife can't find the like. I've, <laughs> I've got more books, whereas you know, no one can. Yeah, no one can tell. I've got a, got a, also the Kindle. I, I got a new um, Kindle with the kind of inbuilt nightlight on it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which means you know I can game changer. Yeah, it's like incredible. It's, uh, I'm, I'm reading more than I have in years. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's great. So uh, yeah, I, I love a paper book. I will, you know. Um, and and there's a lot of books which I you know will read and then will get myself a nice paper copy and to keep and reread. And there's certain books where you know if I'm at, like if, you, if I'm going to the beach or something like that and you want to just grab a book or going camping, I love taking um like a uh, I love picking up like airport thrillers or whatever and just taking mm-hmm. them camping and 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 they're, they're like totally trash. It's great. Um, but I I got to say, but no, hundred percent. So. And the passion behind that, I I'm gonna give that two points. That's great. <laughs> You need more than two points, Tara. <laughs> uh, well, uh, it's a new for... year. So this is a whole new <laughs> exactly, score now. Yeah. I'm two nil up. Uh, thanks very much, Ethan. That, that was a lot of fun. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please leave a comment down below. Hit that thumbs up button. And be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK page one, as evidenced here. And our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later.